in Ohio's capital, a field becomes a graveyard when a woman's body is discovered. But solving the murder would be a challenge. Detectives turn to a difficult and rare technique in hopes of finding her killer. 911 receives a desperate call in Fort Worth, Texas. A man's wife is shot. Forensic investigators search for clues in unlikely places, hoping the victim herself could provide information needed to determine how and why she died. Whether a crime is meticulously planned or carried out in a moment of passion, perpetrators leave behind evidence. With a discerning eye, investigators reveal fatal impressions killers leave behind. In this episode, some of the names have been changed. Columbus, the capital of Ohio, is known for its wholesome Midwest values, a growing community where the rate of violent crime is much lower than other cities its size. Yet on November 7th, 2001, Richard Middleton made a startling discovery. In a vacant lot, he found the body of a nude female lying in a tangle of overgrown weeds. He immediately called 911. The operator on call dispatched a team of investigators to the site. Columbus police officers and medical technicians arrived at the location south of downtown Columbus. The victim was pronounced dead at the scene. Investigators roped off the area and started gathering evidence. They hoped to piece together the events that left a woman dead. As they processed the crime scene, investigators noted the victim's position. She was lying on her back. Her arm was raised above her head. And her undergarments were pulled down around her ankles. But the most alarming evidence found by the crime text were ligature marks on the victim's neck. They suspected she was strangled. Investigators gathered a few items of clothing, including a black and white tennis shoe found near the body. Despite all their findings, police uncovered no solid leads. They were a long way from finding the killer. Ronald Jester was the first detective on the scene. Well, we had very little forensic evidence at the scene. There was no weapon, uh, nothing to indicate who she may have been with, where she had been. We found no identification of her. There's no way of, of tracing her to any particular spot or anything. None of the things that you hope you find that will give you a direction to, to begin to look for a suspect. Investigators also spoke to neighbors in the area. Several said they heard screaming earlier but they thought it was just kids playing in the field. But no one remembered seeing anyone or anything suspicious. Crime techs photographed the area as well as the body. Okay, Phil, you're ready to bag her right hand? They carefully preserved the woman's hands. They hoped material found under her fingernails could provide clues. The body of the victim was then transported to the Franklin County Coroner's Office. There, they took more detailed photos, focusing on several bruised areas. Dr. Brad Lewis, the Franklin County Coroner, performed the autopsy. He noticed the marks on the victim's neck. After analyzing the wounds, Dr. Lewis was able to determine the cause of death. 
She had blunt trauma, which means she had been beaten throughout the body, arms, and legs. She had also been strangled, uh, which was the actual cause of her death. They collected tissue and other material samples found under the victim's fingernails. The forensic team detected heavy bruising that indicated evidence of rape. Using a rape kit, they gathered possible DNA evidence left from her assailant. All evidence was sealed and sent for further analysis. The examiner then took her fingerprints in the hopes of finding out who she was. When police submitted the prints to the Ohio Fingerprint Data Bank, they quickly confirmed her identity. The victim was Tina Baxter, age 29. She had a police record for several minor offenses. Police also learned that she had had many addresses. She had been drifting from place to place and from job to job. At the Columbus Crime Lab, criminalist Amarina Clarkson analyzed the evidence gathered at autopsy. She examined the rape kit findings as well as the victim's clothes. She also analyzed the stains found on the victim's undergarments for traces of blood and DNA. We were able to tell that the swabs had semen present by using a color test that will indicate that there's a possibility of semen being present. After we do that color test, we then use a test that looks for a protein that is only found in high levels in semen. This information confirmed sexual assault and gave investigators DNA information about the assailant. Yet they had no suspect to compare to the samples. His identity remained a mystery. To get more information about Tina, detectives questioned the victim's relatives and friends, including her brother. Just a couple days ago. Baxter's brother told police Tina had had problems in the past. She used drugs, but she was trying to get her life together. Her brother explained that she was a devoted mother who was involved with her children. But he was afraid that Tina may have had a relapse. He said that in the past, it wasn't unusual for Tina to go on a drug binge and disappear for a few days. He told detectives the names of bars she frequented. If Tina had given in to her addiction, she would not have to look far to satisfy her cravings. Detectives went to the bar where Tina was known to hang out. I've seen this woman here before. When he passed her picture around, patrons recognized her, but none could place her there on the night she was murdered. Victim. Detectives hit a dead end. The investigation was stalled. In order to spark some theories, investigators pulled together a team to analyze all aspects of the data they had recovered. The team offered different scenarios based on the evidence. Forensic evidence at the scene. Marks on her legs looks like she put up some sort of a struggle and whoever took her clothes off of her had to fight with her to get her clothes off. But they were coming up empty. They found nothing that could advance their case. They were still no closer to a suspect. But that was about to change. Only 11 days after finding Tina's body, a construction worker at a South Columbus job site picked up some tools. Something caught his attention in the underbrush. When he took a closer look, he made a horrifying discovery. The nude body of a female lay lifeless on the ground. Detectives arrived at the crime scene. It was a place they'd been before. This location was only a few hundred feet from where they found Tina's body. Detective William Gillette drove to the crime scene. Detective Jester and I were driving to the scene and we were discussing some of the similarities that the patrol officers had told us over the air. It 
quickly became apparent, the evidence at this location was frighteningly similar to Tina's murder. A young woman stripped of her clothing with signs of sexual assault. Detective Gillette surveyed the crime scene. What we first noticed was that the victim uh, was in pretty bad shape and it appeared she had been drugged for a distance uh, and put up maybe a pretty good struggle. Crime scene investigators once again collected evidence. They gathered what was thought to be her clothing, undergarments, sneakers, which were discarded near the body. Investigators then spotted something unusual. They noticed distinct bruising on her arm in the shape of a hand. They hoped it might prove a clue to the killer's identity. You could see on her right arm uh, where there was a lot of bruising, and you could see actual finger indentions were left on her skin. Uh, I thought it might be possible to get fingerprints off of that area. The crime technicians were careful not to disturb the body. If they could lift prints from the bruise, they would have to take great care not to destroy them. To preserve the body for this type of analysis, detectives did not bag the victim. They needed to keep the body's temperature at approximately 70 degrees to ensure the fingerprints could be lifted successfully. He said he didn't touch anything, he immediately then went. Any colder, and the fingerprint powder would not stick, making the lift impossible. It appeared as if the earlier murder was not an isolated incident. Investigators were now dealing with two crimes, but possibly only one killer. And that killer was stalking the area. He had already found his second victim. They needed to stop him before he added a third. In Columbus, Ohio, two women were found dead, their unclothed bodies discarded in remote locations on the city's south side. Both women were found face up. Investigators determined that the first victim, Tina Baxter, was strangled and sexually assaulted. Yet they had no suspect matching DNA samples. And the circumstances surrounding the second victim were hauntingly similar. With one difference. There was a bloody rock that was lying next to her. It appeared she had died from a blow to the head rather than strangulation. Detective William Gillette continued to canvas the second crime scene, which was less than a football field away from where Tina Baxter was found. He noticed distinct tire tracks in the shaley soil leading from the scene of the crime. You can see where there were fresh tire tracks made by what appeared to be a pickup truck. Crime techs took photographs and measurements of the tracks. But because of the loose soil, they could not make a plaster cast of the markings. At the state crime lab in Columbus, the body was autopsied. Investigators utilized the most advanced forensic techniques to examine the body. The victim had a distinct bruise in the shape of a human hand on her arm. Coroner Dr. Brad Lewis examined the bruises and determined that there was a clear sign of a struggle. She had multiple abrasions and contusions uh, on her arms, legs, and uh, body. She also had significant blunt trauma to her neck. They took okay. photographs recording their particular shape and location. Some other evidence from the, the guy's body in addition to the possible... Specialists then tried to find evidence undetectable by the human eye in normal light. What we're going to do with this is look for hairs and fibers that may have been shed onto her body by the suspect. We're also looking for hairs and fibers that she may have picked up of his car. Using an alternate light source, they looked for these obscured clues. But this examination yielded nothing significant. Lab technicians then proceeded with a fairly complex and rarely successful procedure. They would attempt to lift the perpetrator's fingerprints from the body itself. 
Special Agent Gary Wilgus supervised the attempt. The possibility of getting prints off human skin is remote. Uh, there's only been about 75 to 80 documented cases in the nation where uh, prints have actually been taken off of bodies. To lift these prints, technicians first placed a plastic tent over the body. This created a makeshift fumigation chamber. They then placed a container filled with a superglue substance known as cyanoacrylate into a warming plate. As the glue okay, heats up, fumes are emitted. Those fumes from the heated superglue adhere to the body in the latent fingerprints. Then what we try to do is take magnetic powder, which is a special type of fingerprint powder, and we start to process the body, searching for any kind of indication the print may exist. This powder consists of superfine magnetic filaments, which adhere to the superglue residue. Any identifiable prints become evident. A gel is applied to these markings, which then solidifies after a few minutes. The dried substance is then lifted off the skin, taking any print impressions with it. The bruises on the victim's arm yielded no prints. Yet on her right thigh, they discovered another possible clue, a perfectly intact palm print. But most databases do not record palm prints. So even if the killer left his mark, investigators still had nothing to go on. Forensic technicians proceeded with the examination. They took inked prints from the victim's fingers. An ID was made immediately. Her name was Kathy Henderson. She too, like the first victim, had a police record and a history of drug use. Detectives notified the family. Sir, but uh, this afternoon we found your daughter, uh, and she is a uh, victim of a homicide. Tell me exactly what happened that night. Midnight. They questioned Kathy's roommate well, and a friend. The friend remembered the night Henderson disappeared. Um, Kathy's away. friend said that the three of them had been cruising around. Kind of bored, so she... At about midnight, he dropped off her roommate in downtown Columbus. Kathy asked to be left off as well, but asked him to wait. She'd be back. He said he suspected she was trying to score some drugs. He waited for her, but she never returned. Frustrated, he went home. That was the last time they saw Kathy alive. News of the Kathy Henderson murder made front page headlines. Police knew this would create fear within the Columbus community, but they hoped it would lead to more clues about the two crimes. It didn't take long before a witness came forward. Bill, it's Mr. Dooley. Hi, Mr. Dooley, how are you? He said he saw a dark pickup truck in the early morning hours at the construction site where Henderson's body was found. Yeah, well, I typically drive to work down here. As he drove past, he noticed the vehicle. The headlights were on, but he did not see anyone inside. Can you describe that vehicle to us? He said he really didn't think much about it until he read the newspaper articles about the murders. He then showed investigators exactly where the vehicle had been parked. Detectives went to the construction area where the truck was sighted and questioned the workers at that location. Be any reason for a vehicle be on your lot? The workers confirmed it was unusual for a vehicle to be there on a Sunday. Uh -huh. They also told detectives that none of the employees owned a truck that fit the description. Detectives believed time was running out. They were no closer to identifying a suspect, and the Columbus community was living in fear. Since both victims were found so close to one another, they decided to try and stop him before he reached victim number three. Police set up surveillance near the crime scenes. If their suspect came back, they would be there waiting. 
Detective Russell Redman believed it was only a matter of time before the killer struck again. It concerned me very much the fact that we had a serial killer uh, in the city of Columbus uh, preying on women. Anybody in it uh, could have been his next victim. Police ran a 24-hour surveillance detail at the construction site. They knew they had to catch the killer before he struck again. But only four days after Kathy Henderson's murder, the detective's fears were confirmed. An office worker on the south side of Columbus was taking out the trash to a dumpster. He noticed the body of a woman lying on the ground. He immediately called police. Detectives believed it was victim number three. The killer had struck again. A third woman turned up dead within the span of only a few weeks. Detectives were notified and left for the scene of the crime. The latest victim was a young white female. She was found in the same vicinity as the other two. There appeared to be blood around her mouth and on her hands. She wore a black sweatshirt and sweatpants. The pockets had been turned inside out. Detective Redmond's worst fear had become reality. We felt very strongly that this scene and this homicide victim were connected to the other two. The victim was identified as Beth Ellen Fisher, she fit a similar profile as the other victims. She had a criminal record for petty crime, drifted from job to job, and had a history of drug abuse. She was strangled and sexually assaulted. The MO appeared to be the same as the other murders. Yet unlike the other crime scenes, police got an unexpected break. Detective Russell Redmond noticed tire tracks leaving the area, similar to those found near Tina Baxter's body. They pulled in and turned around. But this time, there was evidence the tire had actually come off its rim. I noticed that there was a, a pattern in the graveled area of a parking lot. Uh, the pattern was very strange, and it took me a few minutes to realize that it was, in fact, a wheel mark from somebody driving a vehicle on a flat tire. They followed the markings the wheel left behind. The tracks led to a pickup truck only 50 feet from where the woman's body had been found. The tire was visibly off the rim. When the truck had pulled into the crime scene, the tire was fully inflated. But sometime soon after, the tire blew, leaving the rim bare and the vehicle undrivable. The license plate was still on the vehicle. Investigators photographed the distinct tire marks and detailed the course the truck traveled. DMV records determined the owner of the truck was a local man who owned a tree trimming business. They brought the man in for questioning. He told police he didn't know the whereabouts of his truck. Detectives told him that it had been abandoned near the scene of a crime. He claimed he had lent it to one of his employees, a man named Christian Fuhr. He said Fuhr needed the truck because his own vehicle had been impounded. The owner of the truck gave consent to a search of the vehicle. Investigators found no forensic evidence placing Beth Ellen Fisher inside the truck. Detective Redman brought Christian Fuhr in for questioning. He remained very cool. He did not show much emotion. Fuhr told the detective that on the evening of Fisher's murder, he had met two girls and went driving around in their vehicle. He said the girls dropped him at a bar around 4 a.m. and he went home. Detective Redmond suspected Fewer's alibi wouldn't hold up. 
during the initial stages of the investigation, uh, being aware that uh, his truck was, in fact, within 50 feet of where the body was found and he denied being in that area, we knew immediately that he was lying to us. Detectives now had a viable suspect, but they did not even have enough evidence to link him to one murder, and they needed to link him to all three. While the detectives ran 24-hour surveillance on the suspect, forensic teams searched the area around the construction site to look for any evidence that would tie Christian Fuhrer to the murders. But their search turned up nothing. Then, detectives got a break. A woman came forward. She said she had been helping all three victims kick their drug problem. She told police she had important information about the night Beth Ellen Fisher was killed. She remembered running into a man who said Beth Ellen owed him $50. They both left, got in a black pickup truck, and drove off together. The woman knew Beth Ellen referred to the man as Woodman. He had this nickname because he worked for a tree trimming company. Police finally had probable cause to obtain search warrants for the Christian Fuhr vehicle. Since Fuhr's vehicle was already impounded on another unrelated parking violation, police were able to move quickly. Forensic technicians arrived to process the truck. Ink prints were made of the tires. Detective Redman and his team knew they had to get this serial killer off the street. At the Columbus Crime Lab, criminalist Heather Crock reviewed tire track photos taken from the scene of the second murder. She compared these to the truck fewer owned. I was able to say that the tread pattern in the impression had the same class characteristics or similar tread pattern to one of the tires on the suspect's vehicle. With consistent characteristics matching the tire, police believe they could now place two different trucks that Fuhr had driven, his own and the one he borrowed from his boss, at two of the murder sites. But they needed to definitively prove that Fuhr had actually been there. Police obtained a court order to collect blood and saliva samples from Christian Fuhr. Forensic technician Amarina Clarkson examined the DNA samples to see if there were any similarities. Clarkson was able to confirm what police suspected. When I compared the samples of the semen found on the victim's body and the bloodstain standard from Christian Fuhrer, I found that those samples matched each other. Investigators corroborated this with other evidence taken from Kathy Henderson's body. Robin Roggenbeck, a forensic scientist for the Bureau of Criminal Identification and Investigation, compared the palm print found on the second victim's body to those collected from Fuhrer. I found 12 to 13 points uh, that did match positively. In my opinion, this was 100% identification. I had two other qualified examiners verify these prints, and they also came up with the same conclusion. This evidence not only proved Fuhr had touched the woman, it also meant he had done so after she had died, since prints on living skin will disappear quickly due to perspiration and body movement. Armed with these facts, detectives brought in Fuhr to interrogate him again. Christian, we want to talk to you today about three women who have been murdered in the south end of Columbus. They presented him with the details of what they had uncovered, but he refused to talk. Even without a confession, the evidence was overwhelming. I'm sorry, but I have no other choice but to charge you with the murder. On November 28, 2001, police arrested Christian Fuhr on three counts of murder. Using forensic evidence, investigators pieced together the events that led to Kathy Henderson's murder. 
Fuhr had probably lured Kathy into his truck by promising her drugs. He then drove to the construction site. There, he became violent. Her resistance only fueled his rage. Out of control, he found a rock and struck her dead. In order to avoid the death penalty, Christian Fuhr eventually pled guilty to all three murders. He was sentenced to three consecutive life sentences without the possibility of parole. Some killers prey on strangers, making it easier for them to conceal their identity. Others strike closer to home, leaving traces that are more difficult to hide. Fort Worth, Texas is known as the city where the West begins. With its rich cowboy heritage, guns outnumber people three to one. But rarely do the citizens believe they'll be used to commit violent crime. Yet on the night of March 14, 1995, violence was all too present. A dispatch officer received a frantic 911 call. The caller identified himself as Warren Horanick, a former police officer. He explained that his wife had shot herself and needed an ambulance. Fort Worth police officers responded immediately. When paramedics arrived, Warren Horanek met them at the door. He had blood on his shirt. His wife, Bonnie, lay on her bed. Paramedics noticed what appeared to be a gunshot wound to the chest. They tried to find a pulse or any signs of life, but they were too late. Bonnie Horanek was dead. Crime technicians and investigators arrived at the scene and began collecting evidence. When detectives searched the bedroom, they found two weapons, a shotgun and a 38 caliber revolver. Detective J.D. Roberts of the Fort Worth Police Department was the lead investigator. He retraced the path of the bullet. The projectile had gone completely through her through the mattress, through the springs, and had damaged the carpet under the bed. The bullet's trajectory indicated that it had passed through the victim while she was lying on the bed. There were no bullet fragments found anywhere in the room. Detectives noted a pillowcase wrapped tightly around Bonnie's neck. But there was no evidence that indicated a struggle. Police examined the doors and windows to see if there were signs of forced entry. But there was nothing out of the ordinary. This had not been a break-in. In Fort Worth, Texas, Bonnie Hornick was found shot to death in her bedroom. There was no evidence of a break-in, and detectives suspected suicide. Detectives needed to speak with Bonnie's husband to try and piece together the events that led to her death. But the way Warren was acting, police detective J.D. Robert knew it would be a challenge. He had been drinking, and he was belligerent towards the officers, and not really cooperative. Hornick told the officers that he loved his wife and couldn't believe that she had shot herself. Since he was the only one in the house at the time of his wife's death, he needed to give a formal statement and was escorted to the police station. Investigators asked Horneck what happened that night. He told police that he and Bonnie had gone out to dinner, where he admitted to having a few beers. When they returned home, Bonnie had gone straight to bed. She was an attorney and had appointments early the next morning. Warren said he wasn't tired, so he stayed up in the living room to watch TV. Shortly after they both settled in, 
Warren said he heard a single gunshot. Startled, he quickly grabbed his shotgun and headed into the bedroom. He thought there was an intruder in his home. To his horror, he said he found his wife shot, and she wasn't moving. He phoned 911 and performed CPR in a desperate effort to revive her. He said the 911 operator instructed him to wrap the pillowcase around Bonnie's neck to control the bleeding. When asked where his wife got the handgun, Warren Horanek told detectives the 38 caliber revolver found in the bedroom was his. It was kept in a holster under the mattress on Bonnie's side of the bed. Detectives asked Horanek to submit to a gunpowder residue test. He agreed, but there was no trace of gunpowder. Investigators also requested that Horanek's clothing be sent to the crime lab for forensic analysis. Although all the evidence appeared to point towards suicide, detectives needed to complete the investigation. They told Warren Horanek to go home and they would call him with any further questions. Investigators hoped the autopsy would provide the answers needed to close the case. The coroner examined the body and determined Bonnie was shot once in the chest. He noted the bullet's path. It entered the chest and exited her back. No bullet fragments were recovered from the body. In many ways, her death appeared to be a suicide. The angle of the wound and the position, just to the left of center, was consistent with a self-inflicted injury. But other evidence pointed in a different direction. When a gun is fired, it usually leaves behind traces of gunpowder on the shooter. The coroner examined the victim's hands for signs of gunpowder residue. None was found. Unable to definitively prove either homicide or suicide, the official autopsy report characterized the death of Bonnie Horanek as undetermined. Detective J.D. Roberts had many questions. During the investigation of this death of Bonnie Hornick, it appears that the crime scene had been tampered with. Since no projectile was found, her hands apparently had been wiped clean because there was no blood on her hand. In an attempt to prove the suicide theory, detectives met with Bonnie's parents. But often, family members don't want to accept that their loved one committed suicide. Bonnie's parents were no different. They refused to believe their daughter had taken her own life. The only stress they were aware of was her marriage. Bonnie had told her parents Warren was struggling with a drinking problem. She said she considered leaving her husband, but was trying to make the marriage work. Although her parents said nothing specific, they believed Warren Horanick may have had something to do with their daughter's death. Bonnie's parents urged the detective to keep the investigation open. But with little to go on and no solid proof of either murder or suicide, detectives had hit a dead end. The evidence they did have divided investigators right down the middle. The gun was checked for fingerprints, but the surface of the gun's handle was not conducive to prints, and none were recovered. Detective Jim Varnon, who was also assigned to the case, believed the facts clearly pointed to suicide. No gunshot residue found on the hands of the decedent doesn't mean much to us because not all guns emit gunpowder residue when they're fired. Investigators needed to determine how much residue the gun typically left behind. That gun was tested and it was found to be a very clean firing gun. It doesn't emit gunshot residue. So it's no surprise that we did not find gunshot residue on the hands of Bonnie Horneck or Warren Horneck. Once again, no solid proof. 
the investigation was at a standstill. Detectives turned to another piece of evidence found at the crime scene, hoping it would provide clues as to what occurred that night. At the Fort Worth Crime Lab, blood spatter expert Max Courtney examined Warren Horanek's blood-stained shirt. Courtney needed to determine where Horanek was when his wife was shot. Was he close enough to have her blood spattered across his chest? But his findings were far from conclusive. The blood stains on the Warren Hornick shirt consisted of small to medium-sized blood droplets, which would be consistent with uh, blood from a gunshot wound or also equally uh, consistent with expirated blood that might have come perhaps from Bonnie Hornick's uh, chest wound while he was doing CPR on her. This information appeared to support the theory that Warren had tried to save Bonnie's life, not take it. Given the lack of evidence proving murder, there seemed to be only one obvious conclusion. Bonnie Hornig took her own life. It was a very uh, typical suicide. Bonnie's parents continued to suspect Warren Hornig had killed their daughter. They refused to accept suicide as the cause of death. But at this point, there was no other evidence that pointed to the contrary the official cause of death would remain undetermined. And unless someone could uncover new evidence, that is the way it would stay. In Fort Worth, Texas, Bonnie Horanek was found on her bed, shot to death. There was evidence that indicated suicide, but nothing in the victim's past to support it. The state of their marriage, the lack of gunshot residue, and the fact that her husband, Warren, had blood on his shirt all raised suspicions. The coroner wasn't certain whether her wounds indicated suicide or murder. Because preliminary forensic analysis was inconclusive, the DA knew it would be impossible to get an indictment. Bonnie's parents refused to believe their daughter took her own life. Frustrated, they enlisted the help of private attorney Mike Ware to look into the case. I'd known Bonnie. I believed very, very strongly that this was not a suicide. Um, so uh, if it wasn't a suicide, uh, the only other logical conclusion was, was that it was a homicide. Ware checked Warren Horanek's record as a police officer, reviewing his personnel file. The facts were troubling. While on the force, Horanek had accumulated a string of drunk and disorderly charges. And he discovered something even more disturbing. On several occasions, he fired his weapon at home. After one of his more violent outbursts, Bonnie called police to try and calm her husband down. But Horanek was out of control. He was detained and ordered to undergo a psychiatric evaluation. As I looked more and more into the case, it was, it was very obvious to me that he fit a pattern, and their relationship fit a pattern, where he would certainly be capable of doing something like this. Ware knew that neither Warren's drinking problem nor violent behavior proved he was a murderer. But he did believe the lack of gunshot residue on the victim's hand was telling. Once again, thinking about it logically, that's something that's easy to wash off. He's a police officer, former police officer. He knows that. Uh, and he certainly, if he was the one who pulled the trigger, certainly in a position to wash any gunshot residue off. As it, it, if it had been a suicide, then obviously she is not in a position to do that. But nothing in Bonnie's actions pointed to suicide. She had actually scheduled a business trip for the day following the night she died. The family turned to Dr. Cathal Grant, a noted forensic pathologist from Bedford, Texas, who specializes in performing psychological autopsies on people who have committed suicide. Dr. Grant interviewed relatives, friends, and co-workers, and heard consistent tales about how happy and upbeat Bonnie was. Nothing in her life indicated she was contemplating suicide. 
She'd even kept hopeful fortune cookie messages in her purse. Dr. Grant concluded this did not fit the profile of a woman planning to shoot herself in the chest with a 38 caliber revolver. Based on what I looked at, it appeared unlikely or extremely unlikely that she was the type of person that would take her own life. To analyze the physical evidence, attorney Mike Ware enlisted the help of Dr. Tom Bevel, a renowned forensic scientist and expert in blood spatter analysis. Bevel set out to determine whether the blood found on Horonek's shirt was caused by the spray of a gunshot or by blood coughed up through the nose or mouth during CPR. The expectorant blood pattern would be quite different than the spray from a gunshot. In his lab, Bevel recreated a gunshot blood pattern fired from close range. He placed a t-shirt like the one Horonek wore that night in close proximity to a blood-soaked sponge. He then fired a weapon that was similar to the one found at the scene of the crime. The spray from the blood produced a blood spatter pattern on the t-shirt. He then examined the t-shirt, noting the droplets' characteristics. They were not consistent with expectorant blood. Expect it out of the mouth, it's a little bit lighter in color, because air is what is forcing it out, there will be bubbles. Now, by the time that the police look at uh, the resultant blood stains, what you will have is bubble rings, because the bubble will have burst. Expectorant blood droplets tend to be irregular in size. Bevel also examined the actual t-shirt Warren had on that evening. The blood stains that I looked at in this case uh, did not appear to be lighter in color. They didn't have bubble rings. Uh, most of the stains were fairly uniform in size. Bevel counted more than 100 of these high-velocity blood spatters. Most no more than one-tenth of a millimeter in diameter, the size of a poppy seed. Bevel believed the existence of these tiny spatters positively concluded that Warren Horanek was in very close proximity to his wife when she was shot. When I examined the uh, t-shirt that was worn uh, by Mr. Horanek, uh, was able to uh, find a uh, good number of uh, misting type blood stains that would be consistent with what you would expect to find from a high velocity occurrence such as uh, back spatter. The blood pattern of the gunshot test and the blood pattern on Hornick's actual t-shirt matched. It was not expectorant blood. This evidence meant only one thing. Dr. Bevel believed Warren Hornick pulled the trigger and killed his wife. Armed with this new forensic evidence, attorney Mike Ware presented the findings to the grand jury. Yeah, the right to remain silent. Anything you say will... The grand jury voted to indict Warren Horanek. In March 1996, one year after the death of his wife, Horanek was arrested and charged with murder. With the accumulated evidence, investigators came up with a sequence of events that led to the murder. They concluded Warren Horanek had been drinking heavily. They believed he and Bonnie argued over her upcoming business trip. She eventually turned in, but Warren grew more enraged. He waited elsewhere in the house for her to fall asleep. One of his uncontrollable outbursts finally went too far. Warren Horanek <laughs> killed his own wife. If you look at, at his history, at his escalating patterns of domestic abuse, you know, I mean, this is all in retrospect, but uh, it's clear which way he was headed. In August 1996, after a week-long trial, Warren Horanek was found guilty of murder. He was sentenced to 30 years in prison. When a murder occurs, assailants try to outsmart investigators by covering their tracks. Yet advances in forensic science bring even the smallest details to light, revealing the fatal impressions that lead killers directly to justice. In Northern California, a 
fire rages in the middle of the night. A woman's charred body is discovered in the smoldering aftermath. But how she turned up dead remains a mystery. Detectives turn to forensic science in the hopes of uncovering the answers to their many questions. When investigators start sifting through the ashes, they have no idea it will lead to a trail of deception. This is a case of out-and-out -out lies, and not one, but two cold-blooded murders. When people trust their killer with their secrets, their money, and their lives, it can very well turn out to be a tragic case of misplaced loyalty. In this episode, some of the names have been changed. The city of Berkeley, California is well known for its hippie counterculture and bohemian lifestyle. Nestled in the rolling hills just across the bridge from San Francisco, it's a magnet for people of all walks of life. Criminals can hide in plain sight making it a perfect place to cover up an insidious crime. In the early morning hours of June 25th, 1994, a loud explosion rocked the home of James Hutchings. It was four in the morning, and his next door neighbor, Virginia Bailey's house was on fire. He rushed to call the fire department but took consolation in the knowledge that Bailey was out of town. Yeah, there, there's a fire. My neighbor's house is on fire. Yes. 29 Do you know who lives here? Virginia Bailey? Is she at home right now? She's out of town. OK, we're sending the fire department. We're on the way. Thank you. Dispatchers immediately dispatched the Berkeley Fire Department to the scene. Firefighters rushed to what they thought was an unoccupied home. When they arrived, shooting flames were visible through the window. Working deliberately for several hours, the firemen extinguished the fire. Firefighters entered the house to make sure the fire was out. They noticed the majority of the damage from the blaze was in the dining room. Deputy Fire Marshal Wayne Inouye was on the scene. When I got on the scene, I found a two-story residential uh, dwelling. I went into the first floor, and the first floor wasn't that badly damaged. I proceeded up to the second floor, and that's where the majority of the fire damage was. There was a lot of smoke damage uh, on the second floor, and in the dining room, it was, there was heavy fire damage. Hey Chuck, shine your light in here. Over to the right. What is that? Body. Is it a body? It was there they made a shocking discovery. A body lying face down in the smoldering debris, clearly dead. We've got a confirmed 8900 in this location. Notify the fire marshals. Better get the coroner started up this way. They also noticed something odd about the scene. The room was virtually without furniture, and the body was found six feet from the fireplace. When firefighters discover a body, they are required to notify the coroner's office. 
coroner technicians arrived on the scene. They noticed the victim had severe burns on both her head and her hands. James Hutchings was shocked to learn that his neighbor might have perished in the fire. I heard a huge explosion. Heard an explosion. He knew Virginia was supposed to be in Salt Lake City for a wedding. And if she were home, he wondered why her car was not in the driveway. You looked out the window, did you see anybody out there? No. Anybody running from the house? Nope, just flames. How about flames? With what they learned from the neighbor, investigators now turned to science to piece together the events that led to a tragic outcome. An autopsy was performed at the state crime lab in Berkeley, California. Even though Virginia Bailey was reportedly out of town, forensic experts identified the body using x-rays. The victim was Virginia Bailey. She was home at the time of the fire. But other evidence quickly deemed the exam anything but routine. Upon looking at the body, the first thing the ME noticed was severe decomposition a finding inconsistent with the person who supposedly just died. I think I'd like to look at the x-rays. We're going to do it. We're going to suffer here. Even more telling were maggots found in the chest cavity and on the clothing of the corpse. Maggots usually take somewhere between 24 to 48 hours to appear and do so only on dead bodies but there could be no logical reason they would appear on the charred body of a fire victim so soon after her death. Dr. Paul Herman of the coroner's office reviewed the autopsy results and examined the photographs. There was something peculiar about this case because there was evidence of decomposition of the body, uh, even to the point uh, that there were some maggots present on the body and in the clothing. Uh, indicating that this person had died long before this fire had occurred. Since the autopsy revealed the presence of maggots, entomologist Jeffrey Wells was brought in to help establish time of death. Due to their size, he was able to determine that Bailey died at least three days before she appeared to be killed in the fire. If you estimate the age of a maggot found on a body, this gives you a pretty good minimum time since death. Uh, the reason for this is flies almost never deposit their eggs or larvae on a live person. Almost always the person must be dead when that happens. If I can estimate the age of a maggot, that gives me a minimum time since death. For example, if I pluck a maggot off of a corpse and I am pretty sure that it is three days old, Almost certainly, that person has been dead for at least three days. Dr. Wells definitively concluded that Virginia Bailey didn't die in the fire. Investigators' worst fears were coming to light. The case was now a criminal matter, and at the Berkeley Police Department, Inspector Al Bierce was assigned the file. things clearly didn't add up. And Bierce needed to find out what or who had killed Virginia Bailey. If she had died naturally, it would have been impossible for this fire to have occurred as a natural outgrowth of her death. For example, if she was walking across the room with some kind of a material and then suffered a heart attack, fell, started the fire, there wasn't going to be any de decomposition there. Bierce's first move was to meet with the victim's brother, who had some questions of his own. They began to create a timeline leading up to Virginia's death. When was the last time that you talked to her by phone? He hadn't heard from his sister for weeks before the fire. He always got a call from his sister on his birthday. He didn't get a call. That was totally out of character for her. 
Virginia and her brother were extremely close and had recently attended Hi. a friend's wedding. Hello there. I just want both of you to know that I love Her brother you believed so that something didn't so sit happy. right about his sister's disappearance. I see that both of you are just made for each other. He said the and two usually spoke all the time. Yet he had left messages on her answering machine and heard nothing back from her. Virginia's brother told Inspector Bierce that Christine Lloyd, Virginia's financial advisor, had been house-sitting for his sister. He also told him that some of Virginia's furniture was missing from her house. That's all I've got for now. I know where you are down at the motel. Um, Inspector like Bierce was faced with many questions. He was at the beginning of a complicated investigation. Bierce needed to uncover evidence to find out if someone had killed Virginia Bailey and tried to make it look like an accidental fire death. And perhaps what he was looking for was buried in the ashes of the fire. A deadly fire ravaged the home of Virginia Bailey and investigators grew suspicious. After only a preliminary investigation, Berkeley Police Inspector Al Bierce thought he had a murder on his hands. Autopsy reports revealed the presence of maggots on a body found at the scene of the fire. Scientists conclusively proved that Virginia Bailey had already been dead for at least three days before the fire started. Inspector Bierce decided to visit the scene of the crime firsthand. When he arrived, the fire investigator pointed out burn patterns. There's no charring on the wood or anything, so the leads believe that this it didn't start here at the fireplace. Things did not add up. They noticed evidence of poor patterns near the body. Did we come in with a snipper that night? This would indicate the presence of an accelerant. It was poured over the body and perhaps the most telling sign, the body was discovered over six feet from the fireplace. If the fire began in the fireplace, there should be burn marks that led to the body. There were none. The area directly surrounding the body was suspiciously intact. The investigator believed this was arson. He hoped those closest to Virginia could provide him with information as to how and why she died in the fire. He asked Christine Lloyd, the victim's financial advisor and best friend, to meet him there. She was house sitting for Virginia. When Christine Lloyd arrived, she told Inspector Bierce she and Virginia were close friends, and she had been her financial advisor for about 10 years. But there was something else that I needed to Christine was watching the house while Virginia was in San Francisco the week before the fire. But she said she never saw Virginia's body in the dining room. Christine said she went back to the house right after the fire. She and a friend were there trying to rescue Virginia's items from the burned house. It was then they saw something in the downstairs apartment that Virginia usually rented. Christine said this was unusual because the apartment was vacant. She showed Bierce what she had found in the downstairs rental unit. Christine said she was worried that someone had been staying downstairs. She told the detective she noticed something disturbing about the condition of the rental apartment's refrigerator. Christine Lloyd pointed out the refrigerator, and she said that just a week before, it had been totally clean, and the shelves had been inside. When she showed it to me, the shelves were out of it, and there was a residue on the bottom of the refrigerator, suggestive of the fact that something had been stored there. 
and she was telling me that nothing had been stored there the last time she had seen it. How many days before the fire were you here? In the bedroom, Bierce found a terrible mess. Right. Looks like somebody's been living in here. There was a mattress on the floor and bottles strewn everywhere. Okay. The uninvited resident had left the apartment in disarray. The refrigerator contained what appeared to be a dark liquid residue that looked like blood. To determine what it was, crime technicians performed a luminol test. Also in the refrigerator, what appeared to be a small clump of hair riddled with maggots. Inspector Bierce had the technician remove the hair clump and take a swabbing of the red liquid. Swab that liquid. The samples were sent to the lab for further examination. But it was quickly determined that the substance wasn't blood and the hair did not belong to Virginia. And Bierce made another unusual discovery. The smoke detector for the downstairs unit had been unplugged. Oh yeah, I went into that room with a very skeptical eye, and it looked staged. That was put there so that somebody would think that somebody had been crashing there, and potentially the person who was crashing there was the person who'd gone upstairs and killed the victim. Bierce's suspicions continued to grow. Little things about the scene troubled him, like how unusually neat, strategic, and organized the squatter's mess seemed. That despite all the bottles strewn about, there were no bottle caps. There were also no fingerprints on the bottles. To him, the whole scene felt manufactured. Jeffrey Wells examined the hair found in the refrigerator for the presence of maggots. The maggots he found were alive. Types of maggots vary. Those found in the downstairs refrigerator were scuttlefly maggots, different from the fleshfly maggots found on Virginia Bailey's body. The ones in the apartment were insects attracted to rotting food, as well as human remains. All this information troubled Inspector Bierce. But perhaps the most puzzling was the fact that Christine Lloyd said she hadn't seen Virginia's body. After all, she had been dead for at least three days. If the body was in the refrigerator, that would support Christine's story. But the science wasn't adding up. If the body was not hidden in the refrigerator, where had it been? I'm saying, okay, some part of this doesn't make any sense. Either she's aware that the body is there and has some, played some role in, in the body being there, or somebody is coming in after the fact and planted the body there. It's not going to make a, a great deal of sense to me. Downstairs, but to... Inspector Bierce was beginning to think Christine Lloyd knew more. Perhaps she could shed more light on Virginia's whereabouts before the fire started. He decided to look a little harder at Christine's story. Virginia Bailey was found dead in her Berkeley, California home, and the circumstances surrounding her death were suspicious. The presence of maggots on the body proved she had been dead for some time before the fire and the story told by the victim's friend, Christine Lloyd, was not adding up. Come on in, Inspector. It looked as if Inspector Al Bierce was piecing together a murder. So how can I help you? Well, as we talked about the detective the phone, met with her to ask her some follow-up questions. To find out what I can about her, her habits. She put herself in the house every single day. She put herself into the house as late as 14 hours before the fire. I've got a coroner who's telling me, or who has told me, that the victim's dead for at least two days. 
she's found in an area where Christine Lloyd would have had to have passed through the room within feet of the body to feed the cats and to get the mail. I'm gonna leave my card. It seemed unlikely to Bierce that Virginia could have died of natural causes and lay there for days before the fire ignited. You can call me or have them call me. It was time to do some legwork to learn more about the victim. Bierce began questioning friends and business associates of Virginia's. He started with her co-worker, Mary Cates, who said Virginia wasn't scheduled to go to San Francisco, as Christine had said. Mary also told Inspector Bierce that Virginia had been missing work lately. Since this was completely out of character, she said she called Virginia to make sure she was okay. She left a message on her answering machine, but never received a call back from Virginia. She informed me that, uh, but said Jen Christine Lloyd called her to tell her Virginia was out of town. I believe she Bierce spoke to several of Virginia's friends, and they all had the same story. When they would call Virginia, they'd get a call back from Christine Lloyd. Good. I, uh, Since Bierce determined Virginia had many friends who were concerned about her whereabouts, mm -hmm. he found it odd that no one had actually been able to reach her in the days prior to the fire. She had missed appointments on the 17th, 18th, and 19th. Yes, correct. One friend, Alicia Jackson, was so concerned, she headed over to her house to make sure she was okay. But there was no answer. Only a note on the door saying she was in San Francisco. She thought this was odd, but left her own note, hoping to hear back from her missing friend. We're obviously Bierce was puzzled. Hearing from anybody we can. Although all her friends were being helpful, no one offered anything that gave the investigation focus. Okay. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you for coming. Virginia's brother came back to the police station and offered up a charred piece of evidence. It was Virginia's answering machine, presumably full of messages from concerned friends. Inspector Bierce sent the tape to the DOJ crime lab in the hopes of salvaging the burned cassette. Perhaps the messages on the machine would lead to answers as to why every time someone tried to make contact with Virginia, they made contact with Christine Lloyd instead. Bierce ran a background check on Christine Lloyd. She came up clean, except for a minor traffic violation. Since Christine was Virginia's financial advisor, Inspector Bierce decided to get a warrant to examine the victim's financial records. Have a seat. Bierce went to Virginia's bank for answers. Years of experience taught Bierce, study a victim's finances and you'll likely uncover a motive. Virginia's bank activity had reached a fever pitch in the weeks before her death. Large checks were written against Virginia's account, not only to Christine, but also to a woman named Myrtle Lloyd. About 50% of the proceeds of that account went to Christine Lloyd. One peculiar thing Bierce noted was a certified foreclosure letter dated the 13th of June. Christine was responsible for making sure all of the bills were paid on time. Certified mail. And she had given him no indication that Virginia was in such severe financial trouble. When she opened the bank, and another red flag, something that made no sense for a woman who was in dire financial straits and about to lose her home. A flurry of checks written in June, the end of a six-month spending spree totaling thousands of dollars. In total, four checks were made out to Christine and Myrtle Lloyd, some dated after Virginia's death. 
Bierce believed he found a motive, embezzlement. Now he needed some kind of smoking gun. Bierce asked Virginia's manager for ATM surveillance tapes at Virginia's bank. He also poured over every financial document he could find. Do we have one for bleaching? And there, among the detailed receipts from Virginia's account, came a startling discovery. Inspector Bierce found receipts for both an accelerant and a garden hose. Given the date of that purchase and the fact that an accelerant was very possibly used in the ignition of the fire, it provided a nexus between that purchase and the fact that the fire had occurred. It looked as if Christine had been using Virginia's account. And the purchase of two 40-ounce cans of lighter fluid and a hose on her account just days before the fire was quickly turning friend into suspect. Oh, we can put it in your account. Pierce's next step was to watch the surveillance video provided by Virginia's bank. Have you had queued this up already? Yeah, this is already queued up. It contained no surprise. Clear as day, there was Christine Lloyd signing Virginia's checks and deposit slips on checks made out to herself. The checks were in the exact amount of Virginia's missing mortgage payments. One of the checks was dated three days before Virginia's death. Yet it was cashed three days after her death. It was made out to Myrtle Lloyd. Bierce needed to know who this woman was and if she and Christine were working together to steal Virginia's money. Since their last names were the same, he presumed the two were related. Bierce did a records check on Myrtle Lloyd. What he found out was perhaps the most disturbing thing yet in this perplexing case. Myrtle Lloyd was Christine's mother, and Myrtle Lloyd was dead. It appeared that Christine was not only signing checks on Virginia's account for herself, she was also signing checks made out to a dead woman, her own mother. Bierce visited with the Oakland police, who looked into Myrtle Lloyd's death. He wanted details. Captain Ralph Lacer of the Oakland Police Department remembered her story. He told Bierce that Myrtle had been found dead in her bathtub with severe bruises to her face and lacerations to her head. And she was doing some financial things for her. And it's looking right now like she was taking... Because there were no obvious signs of foul play, and police believed Christine's story, the coroner ruled Myrtle's death an accident. After finding no um, sign of forced entry in the residence, there was no loss in the residence, or no one appeared to have kind of rummaged through the residence, uh, it came out that we didn't see anything that showed it was a hands of another, and at this point they, they ruled that it was an accidental death. It may, maybe would have come across as an accidental death. Then, Bierce learned that Christine Lloyd had found her mother's body. She had seen the mother the day before, and that she had uh, left and uh, done some shopping, and then she was bringing some groceries back to the house. According to the July 1991 police reports, Christine Lloyd said she returned home from the grocery store. She was surprised when her mom was nowhere to be found. Mom? 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 It was when she entered the bathroom that she made the startling discovery of her mother's body. Mom! 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 Then things just clicked for the detective. He instinctively knew he had a second murder on his hands. And he was determined to get the evidence necessary to prove it.
While investigating the death of Virginia oh, yeah. Bailey, That's, that was my first impression. Inspector um, Al Bierce believed he had uncovered had another murder. And he was convinced the same killer committed both crimes. The woman who had been so helpful from the beginning was now a suspect. At that point in the investigation, I knew that she'd killed my victim in Berkeley, and I knew that she had killed her mother three years before. Uh, and I knew that she had done a very good job of concealing that death three years, to, years ago to make it look like an accidental death, not murder. He was beginning to put it all together, but there were still some unanswered questions. Bierce went to the Oakland coroner's office to find out more. And, uh, what I found, uh, Dr. Paul Herman performed the autopsy on Myrtle Lloyd. When I walked in the bathroom, uh, I would have expected to find a great deal of blood uh, spattered about in the, bath in the bathroom because of these injuries to the head. This was not what he thought he'd find. After all, the victim had severe head wounds. There should have been blood everywhere. But then Dr. Herman saw the smallest of clues. He also noticed more signs that the scene had been meticulously clean. Uh, this bathroom was clean. The water had been drained from the tub, and, and there was some debris from decomposition uh, and probably blood at the bottom of the tub, but no spattering of blood around there at all. And, and that's what I would have expected to see. The but there are Myrtle Lloyd are was killed so by seven separate lacerations to the back of her head. Christine explained that her mother was prone to seizures and said that she had fallen in the bathtub. And in addition, she had a laceration of her forehead. Which Bierce knew things were not adding up. And after visiting Oakland, his suspicions about Christine escalated. He believed the crime scene was too neat almost in direct contrast to the scene in Berkeley. Yeah, on both sides, and some but both appeared staged the nonetheless. To test their suspicions, investigators spoke with Myrtle Lloyd's, Lloyd's doctors to determine if she had been ill or had any known conditions that would make her unsteady on her feet. What they found out would break the cold case wide open. Myrtle was in excellent health and had no history of seizures. By now, Detective Bierce was convinced of Christine Lloyd's guilt. He was ready to make an arrest. What he needed was a charge. At this point, there was not enough direct evidence to make a murder arrest. Since Christine had signed Virginia Bailey's name on checks, his best bet was forgery. He turned to handwriting expert Verl Truman, a forensic document examiner with the U.S. Postal Inspection Service, and asked him to look at the checks for fraud. Handwriting examination is basically a side-by-side -side comparison. Uh, the basis for the identification of handwriting is the fact that no two persons share the same combination of individual uh, identifying handwriting characteristics. We look for various features and habits of the writer. We look for the way the person makes beginning strokes, ending strokes, or connecting strokes between letters and letter combinations. We look at things such as the relative height ratio and proportion of letters and in relation to other letters. He found subtle differences between their handwriting styles, which Truman said were patterns and traits that every individual develops over the years. Now these characteristics, uh, it's, it's very difficult to cast off your habits when you're either imitating the handwriting of another person or if you're trying to disguise your own writing. Usually some of your habits will still show through. And Christine was unable to completely disguise hers. But perhaps the most telling sign was not an actual letter or a word, but a unique and personal signature symbol. 
Virginia Bailey used a uh, star as a dollar sign in her writing, and she constructed that character uh, beginning and ending at the lower left corner or seven o'clock position. Uh, Christine Lloyd, on the other hand, did it completely uh, opposite. She began it and started it at the lower right. Uh, that was a feature that she just happened to, to miss. Inspector Bierce now had proof of forgery. But what he needed was proof of murder. Bierce decided to take another look at the days prior to the fire. Christine was the only one with Virginia's house key and the only one who seemed to know anything about Virginia's whereabouts. She'd even been returning Virginia's phone messages. At the state crime lab, technicians worked to restore the message tape from Virginia Bailey's answering machine. Investigators were now able to retrieve the messages, although they had no idea what they'd find. By comparing the phone records to the voice messages, Inspector Bierce was able to piece together the chain of events leading up to and following Virginia's murder. The calls reflected a growing concern about Virginia's disappearance on June 13th, 12 days before the fire. And oddly, many of the outgoing calls Bierce found on Virginia's phone records began on that very day. There was information that came to me during the course of the investigation that suggested that the victim had died on June 13th. That was the last time anybody ever talked to her. And it was the time through phone records that I showed that she had made a call to Christine. The pieces were falling into place. Bierce felt he was close to being able to make an arrest. He paid a visit to another one of Virginia's neighbors, Sam Watson. Watson told of helping Christine carry a large dining room table, as well as other items, from Virginia's house before the fire. She then sold them at a yard sale. Christine had denied having any idea what had happened to that table. Every part of Christine Lloyd's story seemed suspect. Investigators believed she was in a frenzy of greed, intent on fully taking over her friend's assets through any means possible. Step towards me, ma'am. Step towards me. Keep walking. You stop. Turn around with your back towards me. Face the house. In early December of 1994, Inspector Al Bierce arrested Christine Lloyd for murder and took her into custody. Bierce was convinced that Christine Lloyd had masterminded two murders. But he only had enough evidence to bring her in for the murder of Virginia Bailey. He believed she was motivated by money and greed. You have the right to remain silent. Anything and he say, wanted to see Christine Lloyd behind bars. You have the right to an attorney. To have that Christine attorney Lloyd refused to speak to police. She refused to take a polygraph test. You understand those rights as, as I... Instead, she asked for her attorney. She was processed into the system. Although Christine Lloyd was sticking to her guns regarding Virginia Bailey, when asked about her mother, she shook her head and told Bierce he was wrong. She said she was a loving daughter who doted on her mother and would never do anything to harm her. Apparently, Christine Lloyd was convincing. At the time of the arrest, 
the district attorney's office didn't feel comfortable going ahead and prosecuting the case. What's your name? Christine. They didn't feel the evidence was strong enough to get a conviction. Her immediate release was ordered. Please check and make sure everything is there. As she walked out of the jail, Inspector Al Bierce despaired. I knew that she had embezzled from her mother leading up to the murder of her mother. I knew that she had embezzled from my victim leading to her mur murder. And from a personal standpoint, that wasn't something I could let go of. Convinced he was dealing with a murderer who had already killed twice, Inspector Bierce wasn't about to let it rest. He needed more evidence. He turned to forensic scientists to help him bring this killer to justice. Berkeley County investigator Al Bierce pieced together a story of greed, lies, and murder. He was convinced Christine Lloyd killed both her best friend and her own mother. Now, despite nearly a year on the case, hundreds of hours of legwork and compelling evidence, he was watching her go free. I knew she was guilty, and I couldn't let go. Al Bierce was now working all hours trying to plug any holes in what he thought was an airtight case against Christine Lloyd. The district attorney's office refused to prosecute the case, stating the evidence was circumstantial and it would not hold up in court. But Al Bierce had worked too hard to let this one slip through his fingers. By the time I got through, when I was that, at that point in the investigation, I knew that she'd killed my victim in Berkeley, and I knew that she had killed her mother three years before. Uh, and I knew that she had done a very good job of concealing that death three years, to, years ago to make it look like an accidental death, not murder. Bierce approached Thomas Rogers, the head of the trial staff at the DA's office in Alameda County. After hearing the details of Bierce's investigation, he too became determined to bring the case to justice. I made a commitment that I was going to try the case. In our business, uh, many of the cases are much more interesting than what we see on television. There's a tremendous human drama involved. For anybody who's curious, uh, you have a woman who's 55 years old with no record. Why did she kill uh, her best friend? This was the question puzzling investigators for over a year. Hello, Al. Tom Rogers. But as Bierce and Rogers discovered, it all came down to money. Christine Lloyd had been cashing her mother's civil service pension checks. And the men believed that once Virginia Bailey confronted Christine about the house foreclosure, it was only a matter of time before authorities began looking into Christine's finances and found out about Myrtle Lloyd. But despite all the circumstantial evidence, the clear motive of embezzlement, and the testimony of the handwriting analyst, it would be a tough case to try. There was no cause of death no eyewitnesses, no smoking gun. D.A. Rogers decided to take one last look at the pile of evidence Inspector Bierce had uncovered. After weeks of combing through the findings, he was convinced. The final link to justice and punishment would come down to a tiny piece of living evidence. The most compelling evidence was the entomology evidence. If we did not have the entomology evidence, we never would have been able to prove the case. The fact that maggots will only feed on a dead body was the only piece of conclusive proof that Virginia was dead long before the fire. 
but it was the proof that made Rogers feel comfortable enough to try the case. And it was the one hole in Christine Lloyd's story which all the other lies would come rushing through. She placed herself in the house during the time of Virginia's death and the time of the fire. This would be the crux of the prosecutor's case. That Christine Lloyd had committed Virginia Bailey's murder and spent two weeks manufacturing an elaborate crime scene to cover her tracks. In July of 1995, one year after the fire that killed her best friend, Virginia Bailey, Christine Lloyd was once again arrested. Are there any weapons? Right to remain silent. But this time, she was headed to trial. Once again, Lloyd refused to speak to the man who had made it his mission to put her behind bars. Quiet trip coming but in. by now, Bierce and D.A. Rogers had fully patched together what had happened to Virginia Bailey and the events leading up to her murder. Near trial, we reinvestigated and were able to prove through uh, statements and, and circumstantial evidence that clearly Christine Lloyd had killed her mother. And that the motive then for killing Virginia Bailey was to avoid a re-examination of the mother's death. Virginia Bailey had no idea her dear friend Christine Lloyd had been embezzling from her. So when she came home on the afternoon of June 13, 1994, to find a registered foreclosure note from her bank, Virginia was undoubtedly surprised and angry. She panicked, she phoned Christine, and she said, you know, you're my financial advisor, what is the deal here? There was a three and a half minute call to Christine's house in Martinez. At that point, Christine knew she was caught, and it wouldn't be long before everyone knew the deadly secrets she had been hiding for three years. She showed up at the house intent on murder. Using a blunt object, she brutally struck Virginia until she was dead. It would now be up to a jury to determine if Christine Lloyd was the murderous woman Al Bierce was convinced she was. But Al Bierce also wanted justice for Myrtle Lloyd and uncovered that Christine was the sole beneficiary of a $100,000 life insurance policy. So as Christine sat in jail awaiting trial for one murder, the investigation continued on the second. This was enough to indict once again for murder. Driven by the same greed, Christine had inflicted a beating on her elderly mother. Christine Lloyd was convicted of two counts of first-degree murder and one count of arson. She received two consecutive life sentences. In planning, executing, and covering up their crimes, sometimes murderers think too much. Sometimes it is this over-planning that leads investigators to their front doors. And as long as those investigators are listening for clues, they'll have the forensic resources to back up their hunches. And clever killers will continue to be brought to justice. small town outside of Fort Worth, Texas, a truck driver leaves home, never to return. Authorities suspect something is terribly wrong. Weeks pass as forensic investigators search for even the smallest clues, only to find what they feared in their own backyard. In Canada, 
two people die suddenly of unknown causes, and their deaths may not be as coincidental as they first appear. But a mixture of intuition and science leads detectives on a journey to uncover the deadly answers half a world away. Perpetrators try to disguise their actions to avoid prosecution. Yet forensic investigators, using advanced techniques, can uncover their crimes, revealing the silent killers. This episode, some of the names have been changed. Graham, Texas lies in the grasslands just west of Fort Worth. The quaint cowboy town, surrounded by cattle and horse ranches, has a down-home family feel, where picturesque scenery rarely doubles as a crime scene. On January 20th, 1996, the young county sheriff's office received a call from T.J. Ryan's parents. Do you need police, fire, or ambulance? Their son was missing, and they were concerned. The six foot six inch, 300 pound, 27 year old man had disappeared into thin air. Wednesday. He's been missing since Wednesday. Okay, does he have a girlfriend? T.J.'s mother informed police that her son worked as a long haul trucker transporting cattle. She was worried because he had not reported to work for several days. I don't believe that because he would have come to life. Young County Sheriff Kerry Pettis was the first to look into TJ's whereabouts. Sheriff Pettis knew most of the county citizens, so he was acquainted with the easygoing trucker. He was a good person. He was a young man that rodeo, drove cattle trucks, Helped gather cattle. He just worked in, uh, around agriculture all his life. Uh, was the same as any young person is. Always wore a big hat, always wore boots, generally speaking. Since it was out of character for TJ to miss work without checking in, police hoped his employer might have some information about his whereabouts. How many years? I'm sorry, how many years? TJ's boss told him his girlfriend, Helen Moore, had phoned a few days earlier, explaining he was too sick to come in to work. So we began the process of following up. Did he have girlfriends? Did he have a, dr a drug habit? Where could he have gone? The sheriff put out a missing persons report to the surrounding areas in hopes of some news about the missing trucker. On Monday, we began, as word got out in the community, we began getting hundreds of calls of, well, I saw him here. Uh, I think he went there. So on and so forth. And those things had to all be run down, and it was very time consuming. The sheriff met with Chief Deputy Gary Barnett to discuss the case. He also called in Texas Ranger Marshall Brown, who worked for the district attorney's office handling special cases. Together, they focused on finding T.J. Ryan. Since T.J.'s boss said Helen Moore called in sick on her boyfriend's behalf, Ranger Brown and Deputy Barnett decided to pay her a visit. Helen and T.J. lived together on a small ranch where they kept some livestock and a few horses. The couple had been involved for over five years. Helen told the officers that she and TJ were arguing over finances. She said he stormed out of the house and she hadn't seen him since. She told Ranger Brown this wasn't the first time something like this had happened. He always comes back, though. He'll be back. At the house, Ranger Brown noticed what appeared to be bloodstains on the front porch. Helen became agitated and quickly explained that a stray dog had attacked their pet pot-bellied pig. Yeah, 
the bloods from our pit The pig's are wounds were so severe that he could not be saved. She asked her son to shoot it. Of course, pig is. Helen then told the officers that she had placed the carcass in a horse trailer. Do you mind if we Ranger Brown wanted to look around inside. I don't mind. Would you go with us? Sure. Although everything appeared to be in order, one thing caught his eye. He noticed the floor. It looked as if the carpet had been removed. Helen said the carpet was one of the things she and TJ were arguing over. She said he yelled at her because the carpet was filthy and that she was a bad housekeeper. She wanted to make him happy, so she tore it up and took it outside. She explained that the carpeting was too heavy to drag to the side of the road, so she thought it would be easier to burn it. Yeah, why don't you clean the house up once in a while? Was there something on the carpet that you didn't want us to see? Well, no, Carrie, y'all saw it. We had the Helen denied any wrongdoing. She simply was getting rid of some old carpet. not how messy the carpet was, so I just took it outside and burned it. Investigators had come up empty at the ranch. They were no closer to finding T.J. Ryan. But that was about to change. In neighboring Palo Pinto County, a resident of the Possum Lake area called authorities. He saw what he believed to be a deer carcass shot by poachers hiding on his land. Constable Noah Bragg was dispatched to the scene. He was horrified by what he saw in the scrubby prairie grass. Eleven fifty-six, Palo Pinto. Gonna need the sheriff and the investigator here, please. We've got human remains. Hello. Constable Bragg reported the torso was that of a large white male. Okay, we'll be on our way. We'll be there in a minute. Marshal, we gotta go. Barnett and Brown immediately left for the crime scene, fearing their missing person case had now become a murder. When they arrived, Palo Pinto police had already roped off the area. Investigators noticed something strange right away. There wasn't a large amount of blood around the torso. Given the severity of the dismemberment, officers speculated that the victim had most likely been killed somewhere else and then dumped in the grass. Further examination of the torso revealed even more clues. They believed whoever cut up this body knew something about anatomy. The legs and buttocks had been removed at the joint the hands were detached at the wrists in the same manner. The victim's head and neck were also missing. Investigators noticed an abrasion around the victim's waist. Ranger Brown had several initial theories. In a drug-related crime, they do dismember bodies to keep the body from being identified. And in this case, <clears throat> that's what it appeared to be in. The torso was removed and sent to the coroner's office for an autopsy. Investigators would have to wait for DNA tests before they would know if, in fact, this was the body of T.J. Ryan. In Young County, Texas, a trucker named T.J. Ryan was reported missing. A few days later, a dismembered torso was discovered in a remote field in nearby Palo Pinto County. Investigators speculated the gruesome murder might be a result of a drug deal gone bad. 
And now they waited for DNA results in the hopes of making a positive identification to see if, in fact, it was the missing trucker. At the scene, investigators gathered more clues. They noticed coastal Bermuda hay, a commonly used stock feed around the torso. Smears of manure were present, as were prickly pear needles. They collected these samples for further analysis. Texas Ranger Brown and his team found other peculiar clues. There was a black plastic bag laying next to the torso. Also, there was a piece of wood that was found at the scene that had red paint on it, which appeared that the vehicle had ran over and maybe the, the, wood, the paint from the vehicle was on the wood. And that was basically the, uh, the physical evidence that was at the scene. Officers noticed tire impressions in the loose soil. There were two separate and distinct sets of tire tracks. It appeared as if a truck pulling a trailer had driven up near the torso. While the soil was too powdery to obtain imprint samples, the officers documented the size and characteristics of the tire treads. They also measured the tracks to determine the turning radius of the vehicle. At the Dallas County Medical Examiner's Office, the torso was processed. Pathologists made a detailed report of the victim's wounds. They determined that a knife or a fine tooth saw was used to dismember the body. They also believed the abrasion across the victim's waist was caused by a rope. DNA samples were collected to help determine if, in fact, this was the body of T.J. Ryan. They were sent out for analysis. Investigators also sent the biological samples to the lab for further toxicology screenings in hopes of proving their drug theory. But what the lab proved shocked even the most seasoned investigators. The lab report informed Sheriff Pettis there were fatal levels of morphine in the victim's body. But no one knew whose torso they were investigating. The answer lay deep within the body's DNA, but the test results were days away. Investigators continued to search for other body parts and additional evidence. Search and rescue teams combed the surrounding areas where the torso was found. Forensic cadaver dogs, specially trained to alert on human remains, were also called in to aid in the search. Despite this effort, no further evidence was found. At the Torrent County Medical Examiner's Office, Senior forensic DNA analyst Carolyn Van Winkle used a reverse paternity test to make a positive identification on T.J. Ryan. Sheriff Pettis was now officially heading up a murder investigation. And he decided to go back to the last known person who saw T.J. Ryan alive, his girlfriend, Helen Moore. He needed answers. Sheriff Pettis wanted to take another look at the ranch. He was particularly interested in the blood on the porch, which Moore said came from an injured pig. Crime scene investigators took samples of the blood. Since Helen said she transported the pig in the horse trailer, Pettis moved it to the impound lot. Investigators would make a more detailed inspection at the police lab. This is Carolyn Van Carolyn Van Winkle examined the blood samples taken from the porch. Uh, 
that blood came back to be pig blood. It wasn't human. Van Winkle's test confirmed the okay. sample taken from the porch was in fact later, from a pig. You. It appeared that Helen Moore was not lying. But investigators were still not convinced she was telling the whole truth. They believed she was holding back something. They just didn't know what it was. The young county forensic team examined the truck and trailer taken from Helen's ranch. They discovered prickly pine needles embedded in the tires. Investigators collected samples in order to compare it to similar plant material found where the torso had been left. Knowing horse manure was also present near the remains, they also gathered manure samples. Inside the samples were visible specks of red that appeared to be chips of paint. They were sent to the lab for analysis. Once again, Vi Hummel Carr brought in a cadaver dog to determine if a human body was transported in the trailer. We were requested to do a, an evidence search of the trailer to see if we could determine if there was any blood or tissue from the victim. I started out doing a perimeter search of the trailer with Mercy, and then we went inside the trailer where she alerted on the floorboards. The dog confirmed what investigators were beginning to suspect. The blood was found in the trailer boards and on the axles of the trailer. It had dripped down through the cracks in the boards and, and come to rest on the axles. Investigators sent the boards to the lab to see if the blood was human or if it came from the dead pig Helen's son had placed in the trailer. Given that red paint flecks were found in the manure next to the torso, they also extracted paint samples for further analysis. The truck and trailer's turning radius was compared to the calculations taken at the crime scene. Investigators determined that Helen's truck and trailer could have been at the crime scene, but definitive proof was needed. Nothing tied her directly to the murder. Investigators went back to those closest to TJ. Sheriff Pettis looked into Helen Moore's finances. Hey, Gary, come here and look at this. The most alarming piece of information was the fact that Helen Moore had recently taken out a $150,000 insurance policy on the life of her boyfriend, T.J. Ryan. Investigators now believe they were closer to a suspect. There's your motive. If they ever hoped to make an arrest, they needed the science to back up their suspicions. At the forensic lab, Dr. Tam Garland examined the paint scrapings taken from the floorboards of the trailer. They compared these to the red paint flecks embedded in the manure where the torso had been found. We have found what we believe are red paint chips inside the fecal pads. And so he actually retrieved paint chips from the trailer for us and we could lay them side by side and match up the different colors. You could match up the colors layer for layer in the chips that he sent us as well as in the chips that we found from the cows. So in our mind, that's pretty much reduces the probability that it's from any other trailer or from any other source. Dr. Garland determined the cow had eaten the paint chips found in the grass and passed them. Helen's trailer had been at the scene. Forensic examiner Carolyn Van Winkle extracted blood samples from the trailer floorboards. Her analysis revealed the presence of two distinct blood types. Uh, in the trailer, there was samples obtained from the floorboards of the trailer and samples obtained from under those floorboards in the axle of the trailer. 
those samples were submitted to the laboratory and on the, each one of those samples, uh, human blood was identified and also pig blood was identified. Further DNA analysis confirmed that the human blood belonged to T.J. Ryan. Sheriff Pettis now had definitive proof that the trailer on Helen Moore's property had transported Ryan's body. He had the evidence he needed to secure an arrest warrant. Helen Moore was arrested and charged with murder. But Sheriff Pettis still needed corroborating evidence that would confirm exactly what had happened. He obtained a search warrant, and his team began a detailed examination of Helen and TJ's ranch house. Investigators used luminol testing to check for blood. It became quickly apparent that Moore had used bleach to scrub the house, erasing any residual surface stains. Any evidence that placed the murder in her home appeared to be gone. Yet when a cadaver dog was brought in, it alerted on evidence the luminol testing could not pick up. This just might be the link detectives needed that would firmly establish where and how the murder took place. Detectives in Young County, Texas had apprehended Helen Moore, charging her with the murder of her boyfriend, T.J. Ryan. His torso had been found in a remote area, and forensic investigators learned he had toxic levels of morphine in his system. Police discovered TJ's blood in a horse trailer found on Moore's property. Detectives believed Moore had scrubbed her house with bleach, and luminol testing could not reveal exactly where the murder took place. Once again, Vi Hummel Carr brought in a cadaver dog to help find what investigators were looking for. Inside the Moore residence, Mercy alerted on blood evidence by the rear door where apparently the body had been drugged through the house. She trailed from the master bedroom through the hallway and into the boys' room, just the way the body had been drugged through the house. The dog had sensed something underneath a carpet threshold strip. Investigators removed the carpet strip to examine it further in the lab. Inside the residence, they also found prescription bottles of morphine. Pettis learned later that Helen's former husband had cancer. The drug had been prescribed as a painkiller. At the lab, the blood samples taken from the carpet strip were analyzed. The blood was T.J. Ryan's. Sheriff Pettis was now convinced Helen Moore murdered T.J. Ryan inside their home for the insurance money. He confronted her with a possible motive. She was wanting to purchase another horse and wanted to borrow the money again to do this, and he said no. And I think that may have been the trigger that really set her off. I think she was probably going to do it all along, but I think that set her off. But Helen admitted nothing. Finally, Pettis showed her the evidence his team had collected. He told her that given these irrefutable facts, the district attorney would seek the death penalty. Realizing her crime had been revealed, Helen Moore told the sheriff what had transpired that fateful night. TJ complained of back pain, and Helen suggested he take some morphine. She gave him a lethal dose. 
With her kids away at school, Helen proceeded to get rid of the body. But because TJ was over 300 pounds, it would be impossible for her to drag him outside by herself. So she wrapped a lariat around his waist and attached it to the hitch on her pickup. She then proceeded to pull the body out of the house and up into the trailer. Moore, who had experienced butchering animals, then cut up the body in the trailer and discarded the parts over three counties. Helen Moore was convicted of first-degree murder. She was sentenced to life in prison and will not be eligible for parole for 30 years. Some find their prey and methods of murder close to home. Other perpetrators travel far and wide to uncover the perfect silent killer. Hamilton, Ontario sits on the northern shores of Lake Ontario. This Canadian city is home to an international population. And in 1996, authorities would discover an exotic method of murder. John Pierce, an insurance investigator, went to the home of Natraj Sukwinder, a native of India. Pierce needed some additional information to process a recent life insurance claim. As he got out of his car, Pierce felt as if he'd been at this location before. Ranjit Kela, his client, had died a few weeks ago of a heart attack and named Mr. Suckwinder the beneficiary of his $100,000 life insurance policy. Hello. Sir. Yes, I'm John Pierce and the insurance. Both men purchased policies naming the other as beneficiary in the event of their deaths. Thank you. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. I'd like to ask you a few Suckwinder told the agent that Ranjit was his nephew and that the young man had lived with him. Pierce was confused. Ranjit's driver's license listed a different address. Oh, he's my uh, nephew. And Suckwinder explained that the address was his brother's and that his nephew spent time at both houses. Pierce left the documents with Suckwinder, who said his brother was in India and he would have him clear up any discrepancies once he returned. As Pierce drove away, something about the case still bothered him. Back at his office, Pierce asked his assistant to pull Suckwinder's file. As he went through the information, Pierce remembered Suckwinder had filed another life insurance claim only 16 months earlier. The claim was for Suckwinder's wife, Priya. She too had died suddenly. Instinctively, he called the Hamilton police. Detective Warren Coral was the lead investigator. Kevin Dinsa, a native of India who spoke fluent Punjabi, was also assigned to the case. The fact that two claims were filed in such a relatively short period of time and were purchased by the same individual raised serious concerns. I understand that you represent two separate insurance. Detective Coral was very suspicious. Both of the people that uh, died, uh, 
had similar symptomology uh, to their deaths. They were young people who had no medical history. The report indicated that Priya had complained of headaches for several weeks before her death. She was taking a homeopathic remedy to help alleviate the pain. One day, she suddenly collapsed. Her husband, Natraj Sukwinder, found her and immediately called 911. Doctors could not revive her, and she lapsed into a coma. Do you really want to go through with this? Four days later, at her husband's request, her life support was removed, and she died. Dr. David King performed the autopsy on Priya. He was somewhat puzzled by what he found. Postmortem showed uh, really the, uh, a swollen brain, a brain death. And that was about the only significant finding at postmortem. There was no actual indication of why she had collapsed, no underlying disease process that I could identify at that time. The hospital drug screen found no trace of street drugs. Cause of death was ruled undetermined. Suckwinder had his wife's remains cremated and sent back to India. Unfortunately, the autopsy did not provide the answers Detective Coral had hoped for. He decided to look into Suckwinder's past. A search in the Canadian criminal database revealed that Suckwinder was arrested for domestic violence. He had hit Priya. He paid a fine and was released. Detectives Coral and Dinsa decided to look into Suckwinder's nephew's death. They began by visiting Ranjit's widow to ask about the night her husband died. She explained that Ranjit had friends over that day including his uncle, Sukwinder. Uh, there was... Ranjit's friends were partying and drinking heavily. But his wife told the detectives Ranjit never drank alcohol, and this night was no exception. He drank... She remembered when the guests left, he had complained of a backache and took some pills to alleviate the pain. As he was getting ready for bed, he collapsed. Rajit! She said she called an ambulance as her husband convulsed on the floor. Hello? Ranjit died in the emergency room. The official cause of death? Heart failure. Well, thank you for the information. Although his death was ruled a heart attack, Ranjit, like Priya, the first victim, had experienced severe pain, taken medicine, and collapsed on the floor. The detectives went to see Dr. King at Hamilton General. Dr. King's colleague, Dr. Chitra Rao, overheard the detectives' questions and had particular concerns of her own, given the peculiar cause of death. We discussed the case, and then he asked me whether I had any suggestion. So then I realized since both are um, Indian origin, and I know um, most three common most uh, poisonings in India is uh, strychnine, arsenic, and chloroform. So I said maybe we should test for those three agents. Detective Coral wondered if, in fact, you. the victims had been given the deadly poison. Now, these are the... Dr. King, the forensic pathologist who performed the autopsies, gave Detective Coral the tissue samples from the two victims, Priya Sukwinder and Ranjit Kala. Coral delivered these to the Center of Forensic Science for further toxicology testing. But they would have to wait for the results. It took time. Given Dr. Rao's concerns, Coral began researching strychnine poisoning. He learned that the plant it comes from is indigenous to India. 
Because it is used as a pesticide and a homeopathic medicine, the substance is readily available. The toxic chemical is lethal and is banned in Canada. A small amount, one fortieth of a sugar cube, is enough to cause a horrific death. It's just a terrible, terrible death. You're conscious while this goes on, uh, while you're in these seizures, these state of seizures, and you uh, basically know that there's impending doom. Uh, you people that uh, have ingested strychnine will say, I'm going to die, I'm going to die. Yeah, I'm uh, Warren Coral. The detectives went to visit the friend who was drinking with Ranjit and Sukwinder. We're investigating the... Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Although he said he noticed nothing unusual the night Ranjit died, he did remember Sukwinder gave his nephew a pill for his back pain. He then told the officers he heard a rumor that Sukwinder went back to India after his wife Priya died and remarried there. And there was one more startling revelation. He also heard his new wife suddenly died, just like Ranjit and Priya. The friend believed Sukwinder had collected on insurance for this wife as well. Three people were dead. And a pattern was beginning to emerge. In Hamilton, Ontario, two young Indian immigrants died suddenly for no apparent reason. The only link between them, one man, Natraj Sukwinder, the sole beneficiary of life insurance policies taken out on both victims. And although there were rumors surrounding Sukwinder, there was no evidence of any kind. The one solid lead was the toxicology screenings of the second victim, Ranjit Kela. The presence of a lethal poison, strychnine, was discovered. And although illegal in both the US and Canada, the substance is readily available in Sukwinder's native India. At the Center of Forensic Science, Dr. Joel Mayer examined the samples taken from both victims. Dr. King had saved blood samples from Ranji. But because Priya had died nearly 18 months earlier, no blood remained, just small blocks of tissue. Due to the limitations of his equipment, Dr. Mayer could not detect the presence of strychnine in Priya's samples. However, he did find evidence of strychnine in Ranjit's blood sample. While Hamilton investigators now believed the young man was poisoned, proving it was another matter. And linking it to the death of Sukwinder's wife, Priya, was nearly impossible. They were convinced they had a killer who could strike again at any moment and they had hit a dead end, fearful they wouldn't be able to stop him. Given the discovery of the poison, detectives Coral and Dinsa decided to question Sukwinder further. The used car dealer was cooperative at first, until they asked him if he had ever heard of the poison strychnine. Warren spoke to him in English, and uh, it became progressively worse uh, when some key questions were being asked of him. And that's when I stepped up and uh, told him that I could speak Punjabi and that we could then uh, speak in his uh, mother tongue. And uh, I don't think he was quite prepared for that because he kind of got boxed in with that. And uh, uh, so when I was able to converse, he didn't have uh, much room to back away from the questions at that point. Although Sukwinder said he visited with Ranjit the night he died, he insisted he never gave him a pill for his back pain. When they asked him about his wife, Priya, Sukwinder became sad. But detectives did not believe his display of emotion was genuine. 
His evasive answers only heightened their suspicions. But that alone was not enough evidence to hold him. The detectives wanted to check out the rumors surrounding Suckwinder. For that, they needed to go halfway around the world. Coral and Dinsa placed a call to Pierre Carrier, the liaison officer at the Canadian High Commission in New Delhi, asking for information on Suckwinder's background. To, uh, follow up those Pierre Carrier sent them a fax from Interpol. The rumors proved to be true. Suckwinder's past was alarming. He did remarry, and his new wife died suddenly, just like his first wife, Priya. They also learned he had two sons who died mysteriously shortly after they were born. It was possible that Suckwinder had not only killed another wife, but had also murdered his two infant sons as well. The trip to India also confirmed Suckwinder had easy access to strychnine, the poison found in his nephew's blood. Dinza and Coral felt it was imperative that they travel to India to collect more corroborating evidence concerning his other family's death. We wanted to determine what the cause of the death was and what the circumstances were. We also learned that uh, the second wife that he had married in India gave birth to uh, twin babies who had also died. So we wanted to determine what their cause of death was and what the circumstances were and, uh, you know, what the connection was uh, uh, with all these deaths and marriages that were occurring uh, immediately after the first wife's death. They learned that the symptoms of the new wife's death were identical to those of Priya and Ranjit's. The detectives also discovered how easy it was to buy strychnine. Strychnine is uh, indigenous to India. It's a tree called kapilo tree, and it grows in the northeastern uh, part of India. Uh, and it's available v readily and um, uh, mainly used for um, homeopathic uh, reasons, um, but it's also available in its raw form. And sometimes it's used to uh, kill animals. Um, and uh, so it's quite readily available at uh, some of the organic stores and uh, homeopathic stores in India. In order to get a conviction in Priya's case, Coral and Dinsa would need definitive proof that the poison was present in her tissue samples. It was their hope that forensic science would provide the link they were missing. Hamilton, Ontario detectives Coral and Dinsa were deep into the investigations of five mysterious deaths. They discovered strychnine in the blood of one of the victims and believed the others were poisoned as well. It seemed all the evidence was pointing to one suspect, Natraj Suckwinder, but linking him to the deadly substance proved difficult. The detectives contacted world-renowned Dr. Frederick Readers, a Pennsylvania-based toxicologist who had advanced equipment calibrated to detect the most minute trace elements. Working with only the small tissue block sample obtained from Suckwinder's wife, Priya, Readers began a painstaking process. Using this method, Reader was able to determine that a large amount of strychnine was in Priya's system at the time of her death.
Coral and Dinsa now had the proof they needed to arrest Sukwinder for the murders of his nephew and his wife. Despite hours of interrogation, Sukwinder continued to maintain innocence. Uh, he gave a caution statement again, stating he, he continued to say that he did not murder these people. He did not murder his first wife. He did not murder Ranjit. Uh, uh, the things that were happening in, in India were all a coincidence. Coral and Dinsa obtained a search warrant for his house. They discovered several items that supported the case they had Kevin, pieced together. They were hoping to find something more substantial to tie him directly to the strychnine. The search warrant was uh, for strychnine or any literature uh, related to strychnine. And we didn't find either. But what we did find was some mortar and pestles, uh, which wasn't all that uncommon um, in Indian uh, homes uh, as spices are being ground for their daily consumption. However, um, it was our theory that um, raw strychnine, uh, which comes in a round brown um, uh, pestles, uh, was grounded in these uh, mortar and pestles and then either placed in gelatin capsules and uh, given to the victims. The detectives submitted the evidence they collected to test for the poison. Yet Suckwinder had covered his tracks. Dr. Mayer found no trace of strychnine. But the fact that these items were in his home, coupled with the other evidence they had compiled, gave the detectives a clear picture of how he carried out the crimes. Suckwinder knew his wife was taking medication for her headaches. He ground up the strychnine in the mortar and pestle, then replaced the contents of her capsules with the deadly poison. He had also offered Ranjit a remedy for his back. Little did the man know the pills he took were laced with strychnine. In July of 2001, Suckwinder was convicted of the murder of his wife. He received a life sentence. Later that year, he received an additional life term for the murder of Ranjit Kela. It was an exhilarating experience. It was a tough fight, and once it was over, it was a very, very uh, uh, big victory for us. And uh, it was um, a relief. Uh, because of the problems uh, that I've briefly uh, outlined, uh, it was a problem uh, throughout the investigation, throughout the trial. So once we got the conviction, it was a huge relief. Uh, um, and um, uh, of course, after the second conviction, uh, we were just uh, exhilarated uh, about the whole thing. Though it may only take a small amount of poison to kill, these toxic chemicals leave a telltale trail only forensic science can trace. And with it, the silent killers come to light and their heinous crimes become all too clear.